So a similar application like the one that I showed you, this one is built off of A-Frame. And I built this this week when I got here because I wanted a way that I could show some of the pictures that I was taking here in a kind of fun and immersive way. And you can see this on your own phones and look at VR mode if you want to go to libby.link slash aframejs. And you can see what it looks like kind of rendered over there with the split screen effect on mobile using the VR polyfill. Now I mentioned that A-Frame is built on top of WebVR and I want to take a little bit of a poll. Uh, does anybody have a guess how many lines of code this takes to write? Shout it out, or if not, I'm going to do a higher lower. 60? 16. Seven. <laughs> um, so the amount of code that I wrote for this application, 19. So very close. Um, and you can't see that. So let me get that on the screen so you can actually see what I'm talking about here. Um, so this whole website here, using A-Frame, was built with these 19 lines of code. And some of them are just the HTML tags. So you, know, you could probably reduce that down to, to be a little bit less. Um, and because it's built on top of WebVR and uses 3JS on all of the underlying components for this, you can customize these and add really complex animations and uh, different experiences around this application. So what I did here is I used the entity component system to load in a bunch of different pictures that I had taken um, and applying those to different 3D things in the scene. You'll notice that right at the top is where I import the A-Frame JavaScript library. And then I can use this markup that's prepended with the A tags for all of these different pictures and giving it kind of an immersive sky that surrounds me. And all of the pictures can kind of be placed around nicely. So showing what that looks like, bring another window over. Right here, I don't have a desktop headset plugged into my laptop, so it's rendering everything just as a regular context. And I can use my mouse, and I can look around, and I can see these pictures. And I put this environment around that I took up on the Royal Mile uh, yesterday. And I can look around, and I kind of have this interesting experience of seeing these pictures that I took this week as if I'm actually standing here, which is really, I think, a more fun way to kind of show off some pictures. And it's a really easy way to do it so that if you're looking at this on a phone, you can have that same effect of standing kind of in the middle of the Royal Mile while you're looking at the different pictures that were taken. As I mentioned, this is really simple. You saw the code kind of behind this. It's like 19. And that's being generous because I like to put everything out on different lines. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to try now, you should go to this link on your phone and you can see how when you're moving your phone around, it's going to grab you. I see a couple of people have tried that and can see. Um, but it will work regardless of whether or not you have a headset. So even if you just pull out your phone, you can kind of look around and where you move your phone, it's going to be capturing all of that information about the orientation of the phone, the rotation, and applying that into the scene and updating those camera controls. Service worker persistent. It exists outside the browser tab and it knows when it expired and automatically updates itself. Pretty awesome. Just like a web worker, it runs in a separate thread. So you can run three, four, five, eight cores, however many you want, all running JavaScripts, not blocking the main UI thread. But the important thing to note is it doesn't die when the tab is closed. You close that tab, the service worker is still there in the background. It might be asleep, but it's still there. A service worker is also fully asynchronous. You can't use local storage, you can't use XHR, and you have to use promises. And if you don't know promises, well, it's 2016, got to get on it. But they're really pretty straightforward. And if you need help, I am always available on Twitter or just send me an email. But you have to know promises and know service workers. Service workers are event-based. Just like a web worker, you can't control from the main thread. I can't create a, a function or method and a service worker and call it from the UI thread. And it uses four main events, install, activate, fetch, and post message. I know I'm kind of running through these, but I have so much to cover. And <laughs> trust me, I'll put these slides up later. But like we saw earlier, the service worker can intercept network requests, and it can modify the requests and responses. Now, hopefully, some of your gears are turning now. Some of you guys are getting excited, you know, a little bit of energy, that coffee's hitting you now. Because this is so cool. This is so powerful. If you don't see it, I have some great demos later. And also, you can cache responses. It has a cache storage, caches API. Brand new stuff. And I'm not going to talk too much about caching and offline, because there's another great talk later. Um, and it's going to be fantastic, and it's going to do a much deeper dive. But 
Let's do a shallow wade on offline. So let's start in the junior leagues, trikes. Remember we said we can cash things and when we get the fetch event, we just return that easily? That's what this code does. Don't worry, it's a lot of code. I'm flying through it. I'll show you later. But let's see a quick demo. So I'm just going to fire up this uh, RESTify server, go to my local app. Oh, it's called Gibby Cats. It's a good name. And we get some cats. You know, these are all great cats. <laughs> uh, but let's go ahead and kill that server. And let's refresh the page. Will it work? Yes, it does. Readme is the first thing that someone sees when they come to your GitHub project, for example, and it's your opportunity to go, hey, my project is awesome, come and use it. And it might look a little bit like this. Welcome to Unicorn.js. In order to use Unicorn.js, you have to install Node.js. You have to have NPM, you install the module, and then you ride your unicorn. Easy, right? But there is so much more that we can do. It's our opportunity to provide as much information as possible to the contributor. So it might sound a little bit like this. Welcome to Unicorn.js. Unicorn.js is a JavaScript framework that allows you to ride unicorns off into the sunset. Here's our code of conduct, and anything that you do with a project should be within these guidelines. If you want to ride the unicorn, then you have to have Node as a requirement and list any other requirements that you have. And if you'd like to know more of the Hello World tutorial, then here are some, tu uh, then here are some deeper tutorials like YouTube videos or uh, blog posts, books, whatever medium, link it there. If you get stuck with Unicorn.js, here are some frequently asked questions, and then you can head on over to our issue tracker. Our issue tracker, please include things like your version of Node, your operating system, give us as much information as possible. We now have issue templates in GitHub that can make that process easier. And then, because you're an open source project, you probably need help, right? So this is also a really good opportunity to say, this is the next ship uh, feature that we want to ship, such as an all-terrain unicorn. And then, not most of open source should be conducted in public, but there are going to be things that someone's going to need to contact you in private about. So this is a good opportunity to say, hey, if you have anything to say, like maybe you're shy, maybe you have some personal questions, maybe there's a code of conduct violation, then an email address can go a long way to help people with that. So that's my kind of perfect readme. Um, so the other thing about uh, MIDI data, we've got two, great. Uh, the other thing about MIDI data is it's really interesting that you have this array of three numbers and you think, what can we do with an array of three numbers? Funnily enough, when it comes to visuals, that looks a little bit like a colour. So what I did was I piped you all a different colour. Um, so I've given you all a different bit of MIDI data. So when you're pressing your buttons at the bottom, you should be able to change like the colours at the top. Um, yeah, some of you have got this. This is great. So this is everybody who's connected. Some of you can control it, some of you can't. Um, and when you're pressing the buttons at the bottom, you should be able to change the colours at the top. <laughs> some of you can, some of you can't. Um, and then what we can do is we can actually analyse audio with the Web Audio API, so we can actually make a little visual presentation. I'm not going to play it too loudly, because I don't want to offend anybody. It doesn't really matter to Some people have got it. <coughs> I wrote a blog called Stop Lying to Newbies. Please, please stop telling us that after 90 days of this course, after 30 days of this course, after 45 days of doing this, you will be ready to get a junior developer job. That is not the truth. Um, and what happens is people like me who come in from, a, uh, from different backgrounds where we've had success, when we hear that and all we now know how to do is, because basically after these, most of the, all you really know how to do is syntax. You don't know how to solve problems really. You don't, it's, there's so much more to learn. We turn it in on ourselves. We internalize it. Oh, I'm stupid. Why can't I figure this out? Why did it take me, um, why is it taking me so, um, two weeks to get a dev environment? Because people aren't being honest with newbies, and we need the people in the industry. We can't keep telling this story because people who could really get these jobs done leave because they can't. Um, somebody who invested um, $14,000 in a boot camp and still can't get a job, they need to go back to their life. And so that's a big issue. In, in other fields, you're expected to be, we come from education, you're expected to be an expert on day one. This is the first field I've ever been in where people are like, you know, you're going to figure it out. Figure it out? What do you mean figure it out? I can make mistakes? That was a big paradigm shift for me. 
Open source is not copying some. I can copy Google and get somebody's code, and I won't get the you know the plagiarism police won't come after me. What? Especially coming from education, and that I can make mistakes. What? I can make mistakes. Oh, I can make mistakes, and no one's gonna call me. Well, I can make mistakes. It took me months to get that or to wrap that around my head because that's just not what most. You don't want your doctor to make mistakes. Um, you know, I mean, it's a practice, but you want him to practice well. You know, you don't want him to, you know, to say, eh, I don't know, let me Google this. No, dude, no. I used to work for a medical company which served patient data in Iran for hospitals through radiologists who could review the data and make the diagnosis on the fly. The images were requested in very high quality as you can imagine, so to make the diagnosis as solid, as fault tolerant as possible. We developed an algorithm that improved the compression rate from two to three to one to six without losing quality, very good first step, but still not enough. We had to make sure that other assets, for example, UI was already there, so data was, that was requested were as small as possible. So what we're going to ask you is, what's the difference between an iterable and an event? And I would say nothing other than the fact that iter uh, events are nothing more than collections over time. So when you have ES2015 uh, generator, uh, iterators, you also have the same kind of thing where as data moves through, you have a collection of data that comes through as well. So the work that they do is um, it's sort of to inform the local political process in a lot of areas. So this NGO works mostly with indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest in South America, primarily in, uh, in areas that already have a kind of existing political structure that can, uh, that just needs kind of like tech support to help them out with the different technology challenges that you have, which are so much harder in an area where you don't have reliable internet or even reliable electricity. So some of these things are, um, just having an accurate sense of territory can be a very complicated problem. You might have GPS coordinates and things, but the government maps might be quite old. Uh, sometimes they're more than 50 years old. And uh, the, the boundaries of rivers are perhaps wrong or they go the wrong direction. All kinds of things can, be, can make uh, talking and engaging with the political process difficult. And it's very good if these communities have accurate data, not only for their talks with other communities and their local government, but also internally so that they're all on the same page and they can build a consensus internally. And also there are a lot of environmental problems in, in some of these areas. So there, there's a lot of oil drilling that happens in the, uh, in the Amazon, in Ecuador and Peru. And of course there's oil spills wherever there's oil drilling and so it these kinds of tools are really useful for just knowing what's happening and for doing something about it. Uh, the place, yeah. So uh, what I've been doing for this contract with this NGO is kind of a combination of um, like tech support almost uh, and also novel software development. So building tools that no one else is really building right now because these areas are so remote and. But I think the, the main reason for that is it's just so removed from our experience here in the developed world. Like to really, I think to really solve these kinds of problems, we have to think about in a real world sense, like what are these challenges actually about? Uh, it's based on this idea that everybody has a gender and that there are two genders. There's male here and there's female here. And they're different and they're distinct and they don't overlap and, and everyone is born with a gender and they have that gender and they die with that gender, essentially. So given that this idea is true, this is how you ask about gender. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see you. <laughs> but actually, we know that things are way more complicated than that. People are much more complicated than that. So I keep coming up with really kind of weird, tortured analogies to explain gender to people. Um, this is my latest and greatest. This is the uh, gender spectrum analyzer. Ooh. Uh, what this space, the, this space is trying to get over is that actually gender is made up of lots of different facets and things. Some of them are physical, some of them are mental, some of them are social. So as you can see, we've kind of got five pillars, I guess. Um, 
And for each of these pillars, each of these is not binary either. Okay, so if we take chromosomes, for example, um, we all know that girls have XX chromosomes and boys have XY chromosomes, right? Uh, but that's not true. There are lots of genetic variations. Uh, there's things like Kleinfelter, which is XXY, and that's one in a thousand male births. Um, but, you know, genetics is hard. We can't see genetics. But what about sexual characteristics? Because men have penises, right? And women don't. But this, again, isn't true either. So we have this concept of intersex. And these are babies who were born. Basically, your gender is decided by a doctor who looks at you when you're a baby and goes, you're in that box. And we can't do that for everybody because biology is, is different. So you're kind of looking at between 1 in 1,500 and 1 in 2,000 births in the UK are people who we cannot stick in this box very well. Expressions, this is kind of how you choose to express yourself. You know, we have this idea that dresses are feminine and like facial hair is masculine and all this kind of stuff. But like I look around the room now and I know there are a lot of women in the audience, not men in the audience, and you're not all wearing dresses and high heels and makeup though, because actually, you know, again, like this is a this is a spectrum. Gender role, so tech is masculine, um, you know, and the nurturing things are feminine, etc. But none of these really matter when it comes to identity. So identity is the last column. And what your gender identity is, is also really hard to explain, even though it's most important. But your gender identity is, well, it's, it's who you are. Um, and it's who you, it's how you conceptualize your gender for yourself. And this is made up of these other things, okay? So if you're assigned female at birth and you're raised female, you know, you're probably going, you are likely to identify perhaps as female when you get older because you're kind of raised in this environment. But this isn't true for everybody. So this is when we're kind of talking about transgender, and this is sort of where we're talking about non-binary as ideas. But the most important thing for you to remember, I guess, from this slide um, is A, like if you're ever bored one day, this is a really cool thought experience, just fill out for yourself. Um, this is mine, by the way. Um, but what was I saying? But actually, like, identity is the most important. And while it is based on all of these things, it also trumps all of those things. It doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter how my body is made up. It doesn't matter what my genetics are. My gender identity is my gender. And that is the gender that should be respected by society and then by us as, as web developers. So when you add progressive web apps together, which we've already heard today, um, heard about today, um, the reason for building native apps kind of dwindles. So you can now start accessing um, Bluetooth in the browser. You can start doing all of this magical stuff. Um, and your progressive web app kind of starts behaving like a native app. So I love the web. Um, and there are less and less reasons to start writing native code. And yeah, they're being used today. So I mean, yeah, I've got five in, in the room with me right now. Um, my phone is actually acting like a beacon as well. There's an app to do that. Um, as well as these three here. And there's another one in my bag. Anyway, yeah, loads of beacons. Um, but it's being used in production for real life scenarios today. So about a month ago, beacons were put on about 100 London buses. And they're broadcasting URLs that are specific to that bus um, right now, as we speak. And so you see we've got a notification saying we've got two physical uh, web links nearby. Uh, Proxama are the company that made the system. Um, and then there's a URL for, for the bus itself. And then we can go to the bus. Um, we're on the bus, and we want to know what route we're on, et cetera. And it can actually tell you like when you get to another stop, et cetera, with notifications. So it's being used in London today, um, which means we can start using it and making some awesome things. Two weeks ago, I was at Google I.O. They had beacons in every single area. And so you went into a talk, and you'd get a notification to say, you're in this talk. Um, do you want to see the schedule? Do you want to see like, the bio about the person that's speaking? Like, it was really, really personal. It was really um, great. Audio. You can see that each frequency group has a different value. So this means we can trigger stuff based on different instruments on the audio that we are analyzing. And it starts very quiet. But if we jump a little bit further and you look at the on the left values and when the bass drum kicks in, 
the full or the, the whole frequency range is filled out. And you will see it. Yeah! <laughs> my thought process when I was building my VJ software in the browser was to mix two elements together. So you could live mix visuals the same way that a DJ would live mix, mix tracks. So I bought myself a DJ MIDI controller. Um, and I sort of split it down the middle. So one half of it controls one div, so you have a div DOM element. And one half of it controls another div, and you can mix those two divs. The divs can contain whatever you like. So that can be video clips, uh, canvas elements, just simple um, HTML elements that you just style with CSS. Um, and then you can mix them via the crossfader at the bottom. I think we are ready for some kind of audio demo, right? So yeah. <laughs> I will start some music and push some buttons. out your mobile phone right now and just kind of hold it in your hand and then hold it up against that projector, you're going to see that they're actually about the same size. Your phone's going to overlap the projector, which means that TVs are just far away mobile phones you can't touch. Um, this is a surprisingly limiting piece of information, <laughs> but does mean that all of that work we spent building mobile websites is going to pay off. And uh, my favorite way to kind of look at it, and this was me going to the candy store a few months ago, um, is if we compare the Twizzler party flavor pull and peel with a nerds, uh, sorry, a um, Sour Patch Kids rope, um, you know, we can, we can kind of look at these, these protocols and think, well, yeah, you know, H2 uh, has this far more complex construction that allows us to deliver more candy more efficiently <laughs> to our mouths. And, uh, and kind of digging into that uh, a, a bit further, um, and this gets, it's, it's kind of technical, but the, the key takeaway is, you know, we have, we have this, this idea of transferring data over a single TCP connection, but we're able to send more HTTP requests and responses over that in a more efficient way. My favorite name frame next, uh, the go away frame, uh, it's kind of a server telling the client, hey, hey, no thanks. But the, um, 
the, the nice thing about that is it helps the clients know um, from the server's perspective what stream they've stopped processing. So if the connection is going to get torn down um, due to a variety of reasons, um, it's kind of just a nice way um, to say, hey, we need to stop the connection. But also maybe more related to, to the programming domain. So this is a study, a study that uh, focused on the impact of uh, syntax coloring on program understanding. So you had to read code, either code that was not highlighted or code that was highlighted. Uh, and you can see in the bottom two pictures, um, so uh, it w they use an eye tracker and you have the heat map that shows where people spend the most, the most time fixating their, their eye gaze. And uh, this shows that uh, when you have syntax highlighting, you are able to focus in a, in a smaller region of the code. And this uh, ends up uh, demanding less cognitive resources uh, and adds also uh, semantic richness. So it is uh, much easier to read code that is, that is syntax highlighted, as you might uh, already understand intuitively. Mission was to keep the NPM registry up, know what it was doing, on a budget. And I'm going to tell you what I learned while I was doing it. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I had actually never done this before. I'm, I'm not an operations engineer. I'm a software engineer. I spent the uh, Audis writing cell phone apps. I had never done this before. But I, most importantly, I knew I, what, I knew that I didn't know. And I knew to ask questions. Here the, so I'm going to concentrate on one of the things I had to do while bringing the registry up and keeping it up, which is, how do I know that it's up? And how do I know how well it's performing? I've got two jargon words for you for each of these questions. Is the registry up? Is your service up? That's monitoring. These are pretty easily answered questions here. How well is it performing? How well is your service performing? Do you know? Do you have metrics? We're going to go into detail on both of these. What's inside our data? Is there value in it? Is there interest in it? And so I went looking for a couple of data sets, um, grabbed some of the tools, and this community has some of the best tools for this, um, and got stuck in. But the whole point of this was me to, for, for, for writing a search and to be able to explore it and to look at you know, a 10-year, pretty rich history of my life. So I did that, and I started asking the big questions. This is a decade of pizza I've eaten. Um, it's a bit of a damning record, to be honest, but so be it. Um, that's about four and a half thousand pounds I've spent over ten years on pizza. Um. Since I've become an accessibility champion, I've actually started to get really excited about accessibility. I really um, love it, you know, um, because I think it's not just about kind of not getting in trouble and making sure that we get more, you know, that we keeping all our customers, obviously those are very good reasons to care about accessibility, and especially if you have to convince your boss about it. Um, but through the network, you know, I've met quite a lot of people with disabilities who've actually been really excited about, the, about them, how technology is actually improving their lives, um, and how they can use things to you know, make day, daily tasks easier. Um, I'm not talking about expensive specialist equipment, but I'm talking about things like this, and uh, smartwatches, phones. There's so much, so many features now um, in phones and watches and things, for, you know, relatively inaccessible things that um, people, that are portable as well. But it's really kind of changing people's lives. Um. When you try and sync and JSONify and stringify potentially gigabytes of email data, it has some serious issues uh, janking your, your render frames. So as a result, what we can do with Electron is load another window. This is a window whose only job is to process background tasks. Um, and it is an entirely separate Chrome process. It is truly running in parallel uh, from everything else. Um, but unlike a service worker web worker, we can also throw a UI on top of it. Apromo creator of Redux actually made that point a few days ago, and I couldn't agree more. He said, every time you do a competing library, the invisible cost is all future collaboration that doesn't happen. And if you've seen like Angular 2, Redux, uh, Ember going on, actually collaborating and like learning and sharing the experience, this is what I want to see. And to quote my favorite band, if you were like really, like if you really hate a framework for some reason, then use your anger as a gift. 
who recognize that? <laughs> uh, I wish I could see machine, by the way. Um, if you're really upset with a framework, you can use that energy to actually work on making it better. Or you maybe write an alternative, because there's multiple ways to, to do stuff. This is programming. We can make our own reality if we want to sometimes. So, let them, but letting that anger out on other people, on others' work, like that doesn't, 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 doesn't help. Um, somebody came along in the 80s, I believe, uh, Conway, one of the mathematicians, and he said, okay, I want to build a replica of this with computers rather than just having light bulbs and wires because that's really hard and very difficult, and that was the 60s way of doing stuff. So what he said is that, yeah, I'm going to build the same thing, and um, I'll do it. Um, not using koalas, this is just my example, do not quote Kwanwe as koala man. Um, uh, so what you start off with is you being the central cell, your koala, and what you go on is that you're dependent on all your neighbors, and all your neighbors are turtles at the moment. And your, um, your definition is based on what your neighbors are. And um, in in papers, they use dead or alive. You, so you basically can be in either of the two states. You're a koala or a turtle. In mathematics, I think they say dead or alive. I didn't like that term, so I'm using koalas and turtles. Way better. So basically, if you start off as a koala, you're the central cell, you're a koala, and you have three at least three turtles around you, you become a turtle. And if you have two or three turtles around you, you stay a turtle. And if there are less than two of you, you become a koala. So it kind of works like that. So what happens is that you have this very large grid. You can start off with a very large grid, a very small grid. So people have been playing around with that. Um, and they've gotten things like this to work. So on each kind of second, you would be changing different states. And Glider is probably one of the kind of simpler examples and really, really interesting, is that, yeah, you have a state of black or white, or you can still imagine this is koala and a turtle, and then you keep changing states based on who is around you. I'd like to do a little thought experiment. I, on the next slide, I have the scariest thing that you can possibly imagine. Now, I don't want everybody to freak out, uh, so if you want to opt out, opt out you absolutely can. Uh, now is a great time to pull out your phone, pull up Twitter, say how awesome I am. That's a good thing to do. But for those of you who are willing and interested in participating, I have the scariest thing that you can possibly imagine on the next slide. You can opt out if you like. Ready? <laughs> how many of you were actually a little bit scared? FYI, I really don't like being scared, ever. And uh, every single time I do this talk, it's like practicing it, I get, I get a little nervous. Like I just managed to give myself the heebie-jeebies. Because just, just in case, who knows, maybe there's some weird uh, anomaly in the universe and it changed my slide. But for those of you who were maybe even not even that scared, if you feel comfortable, kind of mention to your neighbor what you thought was going to be on this slide. And I bet you... They're not all the same things. Because we're all scared of something, but not scared of the same things. And if you felt a little bit of fear right before this slide, that's because anticipation alone is enough to incite fear in all of us and to incite the fear response in all of us. But the coolest or scariest thing about it is that our imagination is so much scarier than anything I could have put up on this slide. So much more terrifying.